Hey, we're in this series called Fear Less and Faith More, and we're asking the question, what if you could fear less, and what if you could faith more? And the thing is, for many of us, we struggle with fear. It might be a lifelong struggle. It could be a season where something has prompted some fear in your life or anxiety or concern, or it could be just a specific situation that just surprised you and showed up, interrupted life, so to speak, and it's caused it some, some fear. Well, for those of you who fear is a struggle, what I want to tell you is the way forward is faith. And for those of you who don't struggle with fear, the way forward in your story also is faith. This is a series about both fear and faith. So even if you don't struggle with fear, faith is still the way forward in your story. And we clarified last week, we're talking about, two, there's two types of fear. There's constructive fear. Constructive fear builds up. It moves you forward. It might build barriers to say, be careful of heights. Be careful of your surroundings. Be careful of this choice. It kind of makes you be cautious. That's constructive fear. It's building you up. Destructive fear tears down, moves you back, or gets you stuck. That's the kind of fear we're talking about. How do we do that less? How do we fear less? And one of the distinctions of how we do that, kind of the main point of the series, is you can think of fear and faith both as a noun, something you have, and a verb, something you do. I hope you have a faith. I hope you are building that noun, faith. I hope you're holding on to it, you have it, you're building it. But I hope that you put it into practice, that you verb, you faith more. Same thing with fear. It's something you have. And many of us, for fear, it's a very real experience. It's something you have. And I don't think what we're asked to do is just not feel that. The noun, it's what we have, it's what we experience. But what you do with it from that point is a choice. Could you fear less in terms of the verb? And could you faith more, the verb? That's what we've been talking about. The idea of do not be afraid comes up a lot in the Bible. We looked at last week, Joshua 1.9. Joshua is taking over from Moses. Talk about trying to follow the guy that was the guy of leading the people. And he's got to take over from Moses. And God tells him, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Those of us that struggle with worry or fear, we don't like it when people say that to us. I've tried not to do that. There's no switch I can flip to say, okay, Boom, I just don't feel that emotion anymore. For some of us, we've gone through chemical imbalances or life experiences or circumstances that kind of fear this fear, or, or we feel this fear kind of simmering in our, inside. I don't think God's telling him, don't feel that way. What he's telling him is, don't live that way. Be strong and courageous, faith more. Because the challenge is, at times, we encounter interruptions, and this phrase, do not fear, uh, do not be afraid, it shows up a lot in the Bible. 120 times it says, do not be afra afraid, do not fear, 131 times. It's the most frequent issued imperative command instruction given in the Bible to us. More than love God and love people, fear not. In fact, if you don't fear not, you're going to have a hard time loving God and loving people. This is in there a lot. The problem is, a lot of times when it's given, it's given by an angel who they show up or God shows up and talks to Joshua, whatever that looked like, and said, do not be afraid. Easy for you to say, I'm a shepherd out watching my sheep. Angels pop up in the middle of the night. I'm gonna be afraid. And so the first thing the angels always say is, do not be afraid. I think one of the challenges, I don't know if it's because angels were frightening to look at, or someone's plans for life were interrupted. Think about Mary, the mother of the Savior, who, who God shows up and says, hey, Mary, by the way, I'm changing the plan. But actually, this has been the plan all along, but I'm, in, I'm now interrupting your plans to tell you about my plan, so fear not. Interruptions happen. Sometimes it shows up with God saying, hey, I've got a plan for your life, and it's scary. Sometimes it's a health concern or a financial concern or something with relationships, but something happens and we're, our plans are interrupted and we need to hear this fear less and faith more message. Let me ask you this question today. Might life's interruptions actually be God's invitations to fear less and faith more? I know for my fears, what I pray is that they would go away, not that would help, God would help build a faith in me that would move my story forward as part of his story. What if the interruptions we're facing in life are actually God's invitations to say, 
Trust me. Stay with me. Take the step. A lot of times, interruptions catch us by surprise. They usually do. Let's talk about surprise parties for a minute. Everyone, anyone ever been to a surprise party? Raise your hands if you've ever been to a surprise party. Okay, how many of you, you were the one the surprise party was given for? I had one when I was 18, okay? How many of you threw the surprise party for somebody? Yeah, that's, that's don't do that. We don't, some of us don't like that. I like to know it's coming. Life has enough surprises. Think about this. Is there any other occasion in life where somebody jumps out and tells you what emotion to feel? Surprise! Okay, we're covered. We're good. We're good. I mean, if you walked in to class tomorrow, if you're a student, pop quiz today, and it's a big chunk of your grade. They don't follow by saying, panic. (laughs) You're going to feel what you're going to feel, right? If you walked in on a home invasion, and they're there, and there's TV in hand, and you like like eye contact, they don't say, fear. I'm going to work blue here for a minute. If you were at a funeral, no one at any point says, grief. No other time in life does somebody shout out and tell you what emotion to feel. We can do that on our own. Surprise parties are a funny thing. Have you ever heard the phrase, nothing surprises God? Raise your hand if you've heard that. A lot of us have. I think it's true. But you know there are two times in the Gospels where it tells us that Jesus was surprised. He was astonished. I'll show you. If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 8. Jesus is actually surprised. One thing did, one person did, And it happened twice where Jesus was astonished and both had to do with faith. Both had to do with faith and Jesus was surprised. One time he was um, kind of just working with some different people, encountering him, teaching and helping and healing. And then this Roman centurion comes up and says, hey, my servant is home paralyzed in incredible pain. And a centurion means he, he leads 100 soldiers. That's what he did in the in the Roman army. Centurion, century, 100. He led 100 soldiers. And why this guy, if he had a connection or a faith, whatever, but he knew Jesus could probably do something. So he approaches Jesus and says, would you go, would you heal my servant? And Jesus asked him a question. He goes, do you want me to go to your house? And the guy says, no, you don't need to do that. Because I'm a person in command under authority, and people are in authority under me. I just say the word and it gets done. I know you're a person with authority. If you just say the word, he'll be healed. And Jesus steps back, and he is astonished. Here's what it says. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with with such great faith. The word faith, it's this word pistis, which means faith, belief, trust, assurance, conviction. That's the noun. The verb would be pisteo. That's what the guy was doing. He saw faith, something he had, but he saw it because it was expressed. And Jesus' reaction to this man's faith was amazed. Thomazo, which means to be amazed, astonished, wonder, marvel, to be surprised. He goes, of all the people of Israel, the people of God, who have this noun that they've built And they built with discipline and practice and tradition and this faith that they should have. I'm not seeing anybody verb like this guy. He was amazed. Jesus, the son of God, is amazed at this guy's faith. Faith is a big deal. So is a lack of faith. The second occasion where Jesus was surprised, just a few chapters later, five chapters later, Matthew 13, Jesus is going to his hometown, Nazareth. And as he shows up, I don't know if it was homecoming or what the occasion was, or was going to see his cousins or whatever, I don't know. But he shows up and people go, we know this guy, we know Jesus. Who is this? It says they were amazed at his teaching and his miracles. But this time the word amazed doesn't mean wow. It means shocked and repulsed, like pushes it away. It'd be like if you were amazed when you took a drink of milk and you found out it was sour. You wouldn't go, wow, and swallow. You would say, wow, and spit it out. They were amazed, almost kind of like, what is this? We know this guy. We knew him when he was a kid. We know his brothers and sisters. We know his family. Who 
has this kind of authority? Who is this? Then it says this, verse 58, and he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of, what's the word? Faith. Faith is a big deal. In one place, Jesus acts and responds because by faith, the guy verbed his noun. He faithed more and said, look, I know who you are and what you can do. You just say the word, he'll be healed. Jesus is blown away. And he goes to his hometown and they see what he's doing. They hear what he's teaching. And instead of amazed, like, let's get closer to this. This is amazing. They push him away. And Jesus was not able to do probably what his heart wanted to do. How would Jesus respond if he were to look at our faith? Which, which scenario do you think it would be? Would he be amazed at the noun we have of faith that we verb as we faith more? Or would he kind of go, I can't do something here. Faith is such an important part of our life journey and our story. And I don't know for you if you'd be amazed by the amount of your faith or the lack of your faith, but what if you could fear less and faith more? I think faith is the most important asset in, in life for all of us. It's the way forward. It's most honoring to God and it's the greatest asset in our spiritual journey. It's our greatest asset in life. And the original break in our relationship with God at the very beginning in Scripture, if you look in Genesis, it was a break in trust. It was us not sure if we could really trust that God's way is best. What, what if God's holding out? What if God's plan isn't the best path forward? Can we really trust him? And it broke our relationship with him. And then the rest of the Old Testament is God building his trust with people by rescuing, by redeeming, by amazing happenings. I mean, just again and again, he's trying to build this trust. And then Jesus shows up and he says, trust me to restore your relationship with your heavenly father. Place your trust in me to fix what is broken, which is your relationship with God, which ultimately breaks us. Faith is a big deal. It's a big deal. So how do you grow it? What is it that we do that takes our faith and builds it and helps it grow? Andy Stanley identified years ago what he thinks are five faith catalysts. We've talked about them at Live Oak before, but five things that grow our faith. They're catalytic, transformative to our faith. Five practices. And so what I want you to think about today is maybe how have these been a player in your faith story? Or more importantly, how could they be? The first one is this. It's private disciplines. Basically, a private discipline is something that's done in private. It's just you, between you and God. It's not in a setting like this. It happens on a Monday. It's what you do on a normal day of the week. And it's how you engage God personally. And what it does is it aligns our hearts with God. It helps us put our focus on him. And it reminds us on every day, every normal day, not just on a Sunday, that my relationship is between me and God, not me and a group of people. It's me and God. Some examples of this would be praying. And there are times we're prompted to pray, usually if that pop quiz comes up or we see flashing lights behind us and we're figuring the officer isn't there to give us a commendation for our fine driving. <laughs> but something prompts us sometimes to pray. But this is, we're talking more about someone who makes the decision. There's nothing that's prompting me to do this. I just want to spend one-on-one -on -one time focused on God through prayer. Or we talk a lot about here about engaging the scripture. That's why we have a, a scripture engagement plan for every series we do. Because engaging the scriptures personally and privately does something for our faith that's catalytic. Giving of our finances. I was talking to my son about that yesterday. He couldn't wrap his head around about why you would give. It's like, John, God's given us so much. Everything we have is his. This is an act of trust. I trust you with my finances. Or I trust you with my time. There's a spiritual discipline called fasting where you stop doing something for a season. Sometimes eating. I know people who fasted from social media or TV. But it's saying, I'm going to stop for a season to put my focus even more so 
on my heavenly Father. And those are acts of worship and trust. Worship isn't just what we do and hear when we sing. That is a form of worship. But privately, when you engage the scripture and pray, you are worshiping your heavenly Father. When you give God the first of your time and your money, that is an act of trust and worship for your heavenly Father. Private disciplines are a big part of this. So is practical teaching. That's something we believe around here. We talked about both of these kind of in the Monday Matters series, that really what we do on a Sunday, we hope this is an environment that's engaging for your faith. It helps you connect to Christ and community, move you forward in your faith story. That We hope that happens here. But really what we talk about here on a Sunday, what we hope is it's applied on a Monday. That you live out your faith. Practical application. What difference does this make in my life and in the world? Practical teaching teaching shows us where we are in our journey, where we aren't, where we need to be, and application of how we put it into practice. And in our day and age, access to the scripture is not an issue like it's been throughout the years. The scripture is more uh, available now than ever before. Electronically, in print, it's everywhere. Access isn't an issue. Knowledge is an issue. I bet for many of us, we could give a lot of the answers of what we talk about in scripture. Our issue isn't access or knowledge, it's application. It's putting it into practice. Most of us know what God wants us to do. We just have a hard time doing it. Because that's an act of trust. And when I say this is what God says about something and I read it and I put it into practice, I'm trusting that God's way is best by living it out. Following Jesus step by step saying, I trust you to lead me and I trust your instruction that this is the best way to live. This third one, providential relationships. If you were to think back over your faith story, whatever it is, there were probably people along the way that made a difference in your life. I can think of several. Several of them helped me understand how to read and apply the Bible for myself. Some of them helped me understand what it looks like to handle adversity by watching them go through it. Some of them helped me understand how to, how to overcome failure because they were there around me when I failed. I, I've learned so much and so many, times, so many times God puts people in our lives that are providential. They allow us to hear God through them or through others. They influence us in the right direction. And we talk a lot about relationships around here because I believe God's given us two great gifts, Christ and community. We're followers of Jesus. We're a child of God. As we sang earlier, you are not an only child. And he puts us in these relationships for a reason. Because relationships will influence you. One way or the other. So when you surround yourself with people and put God as the focus of the relationship, at the center of the relationship, and you're intentional about involving God in the relationship, it has incredible power to transform your life. This is the way we say it around here. Everyone needs to be connected to someone. If you're a guest here today, what I would want you to know is our hope is that you would be connected to somebody. Not that you would attend something, but connected to someone. Gatherings like this are important. But in our life story, it's usually a smaller setting, sometimes even one-on-one, that God uses to help us turn a corner or uses to flip a switch to move us forward. Around here, one of the ways we try to do that is through small groups, to create little communities where people can be known where it's not just sit and listen, but it's also questions and discussion, sharing of our life stories. And for some of us, it scares us to death because as introverts, we would much rather do that on our own. I like the private disciplines thing, not so much the providential relationships. But you were created to be connected. And our heart is to help you connect to Christ in community, in Christ and community, that together you would be a child of God who knows they're not an only child and has people walking with them through a season of life. There was a study done for people that were uh, older and kind of living alone. Maybe a spouse had died, but they were alone and older. And their life expectancy was longer if there was just something living in the house. Not someone, something. A dog or a cat or a lizard or whatever. Like sometimes I think even plants factored in. When there was life in the house with somebody, their life expectancy was longer. You were created for connection. 
And I'm really proud for some of you because tonight you're coming to Group Link. And I think there's like 100 people that are showing up at Group Link tonight. And I'm so thrilled because you're taking a step saying, I want to be connected or maybe I'm willing to be connected. I'll take a step. Um, one thing you may have noticed if you've been at Live Oak for more than, say, a month or two, uh, is that it's a pretty full room. And if you have kids, you've noticed there's some pretty full rooms too. Uh, even, though, even, even though this room feels full, surprisingly, uh, there's actually 177 empty seats in the room right now. But the room feels pretty full. And we have some facilities things. We're just trying to figure out how do we make room for more. Because as a church, we always be focused on who's not here, just not, not only just who's here. We always want to make room for people. But our biggest space challenge is not with our facilities, it's with small groups. Because we will not say no to somebody who wants to be connected to community. We will find a way to make it happen. And so tonight, I think we're going to double our small group size if everybody gets connected. We don't have a ton of space in groups, but we will make it. Because we don't want anybody to do life alone. We believe connecting to others is transformational for your faith. Let me jump to this next one. So there's one practical. Uh, personal ministry is the next one. Providential relationships, connecting in community, personal ministry. By this, what we mean, this is a practice where you step out and go, I'm going to serve. I'm going to do something to be part of what God's doing in the world. And this can be one of the most transforming things for your faith. It position, positions us to experience God's power. Because you're stepping out saying, God, I want you to use me in the life of others to make an impact. But this is bigger than just you serving. It's bigger than just you giving of your time. Our mission at Live Oak is to make more and stronger followers of Jesus Christ. We could not do that if it weren't for volunteers who serve. Hundreds of you serve every week or month to month in various roles. You are part of helping us make more and stronger followers of Jesus Christ, and I'm very, very grateful. But one of the reasons we want people serving is not just to help us do the mission of Live Oak. We know that if you serve, it can be transformational for your faith. This will help you become a stronger follower of Jesus. It will help you grow your faith because when you put yourself in a position that's a little bit outside your comfort zone and you have to depend on God to work in you and through you to get something done, you're gonna experience what people we read about in the scriptures experienced again and again and again that God asks you to do something that's a little bit over your head and you go, I can't do it. You're exactly right, but God can do it in you. Your availability is greater than your ability. Just make yourself available. Sometimes being in over your head is a great place to be because it will grow your faith. And for some of you, God has nudged you to step out and serve. For some of you, he's nudged you to step out and serve as a small group leader with kids or with middle school students or high school students or college students or adults. You're actually the answer to our space problem in community. You saying yes to serve as a small group leader suddenly allows 10, 12 other people to experience providential relationships, potentially. I don't want to guilt you into serving, but I want to tell you that what might be transformative for your faith in this season is stepping out and saying, God, use me. I trust you to use me. Some of our most critical needs at Live, Live Oak right now are small group leaders for kids, in Live Oak student ministry small group leaders, in college, with adults. But there's also areas beyond that. Uh, first impressions is always a big place where people serve, and for some people, that's easy. Saying hi to people is easy. For some of us, it's scary. But some of you are good at helping people feel welcome and get connected. It might be coaching small group leaders. That's one of our biggest needs as we grow larger as a church to make sure that we always, everybody's connected to somebody. That means if you serve, we want someone connected to you that's leading you and investing in you as well. And in small group leaders, we can only go so wide before we need coaches that can invest in small group leaders. Again, with kids, with students, or with adults. There's needs for, for team leaders that help us lead team of volunteers to make sure that those are little communities that are life-giving. Not just that they serve well, but they're loved and cared for well and led well. 
Maybe it's administrative help. There's so many things you could do. And again, I would just remind you that being in over your head is a good place to be if you want to grow your faith. And if God is nudging you to step out, you might be the solution that many of us have been praying for, for making more room for people in community. What I would say about community and providential relationships, group link is tonight. You need to have an RSVP to come, but it's not too late. And we say that very nervously. It's not too late. Because some of us who right now, we didn't think God was nudging us to be a small group leader, might need to step out and do that because we will make a place for you in community. You can RSVP on, on, on the app uh, with, with a connection card. Well, we need to know that pretty quickly, right? So use the app or the website uh, or come see me after the service if you want to come to Group Link tonight. If you want to serve, again, you could go to the app. On the Live Oak app, there's a part that says, uh, or on the website, serve. It's got a hand on it. it. basically says, I want to serve at list of opportunities and things like that. You could use the connection card that's in the seat back pocket in front of you. Go to the website. And again, our motivation is we very much care about God using this church to make more and stronger followers of Jesus Christ. We need your help to do that. We also know that if you want to be a stronger follower of Jesus Christ, stepping out in faith to serve others could be transformational for your faith. The last kind of the faith catalyst there is pivotal circumstances. The first four you can schedule. You can say, I'll serve, I'll give. I'll connect in a community. I'll read the Bible. I'll listen to the message and make sure I'm where the Bible's taught and I'll apply it to my life. Pivotal circumstances are kind of those surprises. They just show up. You don't necessarily plan for them. Sometimes they're positive, but quite often they're not. They're not. Sometimes they're challenging. You might never want to say, I want to sign up for a pivotal circumstance in my life. They just say, surprise. And they're usually followed by fear or doubt or just being overwhelmed. So again, what I would ask is, might life's interruptions actually be God's invitation to fear less and faith more? And sometimes it's just a shift in perspective. When something happens to you, what if God's actually doing something in you? And I I don't necessarily believe that God says, I'm going to send something your way that's bad. But I do think what he says is I can use anything in your life for good. The key and the way forward is always faith. And if we remember what God told Joshua and God told so many again and again and again, the most frequent command is fear not. The most frequent promise is I am with you. I think both of those go together. That whatever you're going through, whatever season of life, whatever circumstance, God can use anything and he's with you in everything. So what is it that's going on in your life right now that you're just viewing as an ordinary, everyday circumstance? And God says, no, this is pivotal for your faith. Would you faith more? Would you trust me? Would you let go of whatever you're holding on to and reach out and grab my hand and let's move forward together? What if you could fear less and faith more? More specifically, where is it in your life that you either need to fear less or for all of us, where do you need to faith more? And what are you doing to intentionally grow your faith? Faith is your greatest asset in life. What are you doing to grow your faith? Which one of these stands out and says, you know what, that's one that I could really step into today. I I could do that and trust God as we walk through this together. Or maybe it's a pivotal circumstance where you go, how could I take this and just remind myself that God is in the middle of this, that he's with me and he's for me, and he can use this to grow my faith. One very important thing about this that I think we, we, I just, I can't, I have to clarify this. There, There is verb involved. There are things we do that we step into that allows God to grow our faith in us. But you can't, It all starts by our faith that if God doesn't do something, we can do nothing for ourselves. Here's what Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says. This is the starting point for faith. It is by grace, God's unmerited favor, God's riches at Christ's expense, saying, you're in over your head, 
The trust relationship has been broken for all of us. You cannot get out of it on your own. By grace, you have been saved through faith. It's the noun that we have and it's the verb that we express. I'm placing my trust in Jesus. It's not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not by works so that no one can boast. There is no practice that you can do that gets us out of the hole that we've dug for ourselves because of our fallenness, our brokenness, our sinfulness. We are lost, helpless, and hopeless if not for Jesus. You cannot muster up enough faith. You cannot do enough good things to get God's attention or get God to love you. You have his attention. You have his love. It showed up at the cross where Jesus gave his life for you so he could give his life to you and live his life through you. What he asked of us is by faith to say, I will trust you, not just with my past and not just with my present, but with my future, with all of it. Here is my life. You're in charge and I'm forgiven. It's the best deal you've ever been offered. And that's where faith starts. Faith is not positive thinking. It's not mustering up enough courage to be brave and bold. But it requires courage to say, I will follow Jesus instead of asking him to follow me. He's in charge. And it's a simple transaction. Is just saying, God, I'm a mess. I'm in over my head. I admit that I need you. I admit that I'm a sinner. I receive your gift. And it's a gift exchange because you give him your life. There's action required on your part, but there's no action you can take apart from trusting him that could deal with that problem. God says, that's why I did it. If there was another way, I think you would have taken it. That might be some of your next step. And if it is, come see me after the service. Fill out a connection card. Use the one on the app and just say, I want to move. I want to accept Jesus into my life. I want to start this relationship. I want to nail it down to know that by faith, I'm giving him everything and believing that he's giving me so much more. I don't know what your next step is by faith that you need to take, but I think every one of us has a next step that will grow our faith. What is it for you? There's some series resources we have available on the app uh, that you could, uh, it's got um, uh, messages, audio and video messages, messages from this series that you can listen to. Uh, you can share your fear with us. I think it was like nine of you did, did it last week. Only nine of you have a fear. Come on. I would love to know what fears we're dealing with because that helps me shape the messages and shape future series, because I know what we deal with. And so if you don't share it on the app, that's fine. It would help us, but that's not necessary. Share it with somebody. You can't do life alone. But share the, um, um, your fear. It's a place, there's a series playlist, the, the, the music we play before service on Spotify that you can hear some songs that might encourage your faith. Um, and the reading plan's on there as well. And so I encourage you to do that and just figure out what can, we always want to know as a church, what can we do to help you move forward by faith? And I know for many of you, what I want to do, encourage you to do, is do what God's calling you to do right now. Do you feel a nudge from God saying, give your life to him. Step into a small group. Step out and serve. Go share your faith. Go love your neighbor. Go forgive that wrong. Whatever it is, there's a step he's asking you to take and it just doesn't move your story forward. It grows your faith. And that is your number one asset in life. As you leave today, you can grab a band. I think we're out of the small ones, but there's the regular size are there that says fear less and faith more. Use this as a reminder. I have mine facing inward so I can read it. So the person across me can't read it, but I read it. It's a reminder for me that every moment is a pivotal circumstance that God can use to grow my faith. It's a pivotal circumstance that God can use to grow somebody else's faith. Where do you need to fear less and faith more? Let's stand for closing prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray for those who are in a season of fear. Remind them that you are with them. You are for them. And that faith in you is the way forward. I pray you'd surround them with people that are understanding, that they can be authentic with and wrestle with their fears. 
And for all of us, we know that the way forward is faith. It's the way we connect into you, with you in a relationship. It's the way we live. It's our most important asset in life. It's the only way to live. It's the only way to die. Help us to live by faith, to grow our faith, to put ourselves in circumstances where you grow that faith in us to where our trust from you is 100%. For some of us, the thought of being fearless doesn't feel possible. Help us to take a step this week to fear less and faith more. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.